Take your Bibles, open them to 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19. So we continue our study through the book of 1 Samuel. I have to ask you a question. When do you think it will end? No, I don't mean studying through the book of 1 Samuel. I mean that little bit of anger that you're holding on to. Where do you think it's going to end? That small piece of envy that you're nurturing, where do you think it's going to end? The compromised life that you're in the midst of, the small little sinful decision, where do you think it will end? You know, it doesn't end or get smaller, but it tends to grow and grow and grow. This is what the Bible says in James chapter 1, verse 13. Remember that no one wants to do wrong should ever say, God is tempting me. This is from the New Living Translation. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else either. Temptation comes from the lure of our own evil desires. These evil desires lead to evil actions, and the evil actions lead to death. So don't be misled, my brothers and sisters. You see, when you give sin, you give Satan, when you, when you give in to sin, you give Satan a little handle to grab. You could say that it's like giving Satan a little toehold in your life. One that you don't think is too significant because you could just shake it off. You know, a little toehold. Well, what, 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 kind of, what, what kind of damage can come with a little toehold, with a little sin, with a little compromise? But you know, the devil in your flesh is never satisfied. And so that desire grows and grows it's not so easy to shake it off and go on to the next thing. From a toehold, though, the devil and your flesh not being satisfied, they begin then to grab the ankle. And before you know it, there's an ankle hold. And then, and then they begin to grab your waist and kind of hold you back. And from the waist, it goes up to a stranglehold, really. And there your spiritual life is literally choked out of you. Now, the good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ is that his blood that was shed for you and I cleanses us from all sin. And since the devil has no more dominion over you, no more toehold in your life, no more grip on your heart, the Bible says that he's been cast out. So to turn back in that direction is really a bad decision. And yet if you give room to the devil, watch out. You give room and you open the door, watch out. Because it doesn't grow smaller, it grows bigger. You see, when a man turns his back upon God, there's always a loss of judgment. There's always a loss of reason and common sense. You watch a man or a woman that's turned his or her back upon God, so many times they do dumb and foolish things as a result. Now, if you ask them in the very beginning, you know, you're heading down, don't, don't you know you're heading down a foolish way? Don't you know it's going to end? The, the, the responses vary, like, it's not that big a deal. I've got a handle on it. You know, don't judge me, brother, and all sorts of defensive mechanisms. But I want you to know, not only, not only from the pastoral teaching here today, but from the life of King Saul, the moment you turn your back on God, you're down a path toward foolish and dumb things. Because King Saul turned his back upon the Lord. He had everything going for him. And as he turns his back upon the Lord, along the way came this little jealousy that grew and he nurtured it. Then he begins to live his life very suspiciously of David, recognizing David as God's choice to succeed him on the throne, when in reality it's true. And yet day by day, God was extending grace to King Saul. He didn't immediately move him remove him and move him on. There was a patience and a timing of God. And so we find now in chapter 19, King Saul doing his best by force, using all of his resources to destroy David, to ultimately kill him in order that he might hold on to that which according to God's plan is no longer rightfully his. And he turns. He turns into a different person than when we first met him. Even though there were weaknesses, just like all of us, we start out with weaknesses, he's a very different person. And it came with jealousy and suspicion and, and trying to take things into his own hands that we've seen before. You see, when you turn against your godly friends, it's always a sign of spiritual backsliding and a deterioration of your faith walk with the Lord. When you don't want to be around your godly friends anymore, when you feel convicted when you're around them and you try to avoid them, watch out. 
It's a danger sign. It's a danger sign when fellowship and being around other believers isn't something that you desire anymore or that you want. Or you find yourself moving from one church to another church to another church trying to find whatever is so elusive to you that's found only in a true relationship with the Lord. Walking in the light, according to 1 John, brings fellowship. It brings a desire. That word fellowship literally means to share in common where you're sharing in common spiritual things, but when you turn your back on the people that love you and you turn your back on the people that love God, watch out, watch out. You're on a slippery path that's away from the Lord. Now, one more thing before we jump into the text itself. Looking at King Saul at this point in his life, some have pointed out that Saul becomes now an interesting type of Satan. An interesting type of Satan, while David becomes an interesting type or picture of Jesus. You see, Satan has been ruling over this world. The Bible calls him the God, little g, of this age. Jesus calls him the prince of this world. And he's been ruling over the earth. As Adam and Eve, through their sinful action, gave that authority up that God had invested in them. And yet God has anointed Jesus as the king the king of kings, and the devil knowing that Jesus was God's anointed has been doing everything that he can to disrupt the coming kingdom. You know, I believe the devil understands this. The Bible says this. The the demons responded to Jesus, and they said this, and I quote, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. The Bible in another place speaks to the demonic world recognizing the reality of truth because they even, the Bible says even the demons tremble. They move upon what they know. And Jesus, he's redeemed the world from the power of the devil and darkness, and yet he has not yet ascended to his throne. He's not even yet begun to rule and reign over the earth. He reigns only in the hearts and the lives of those that are loyal to him. If you want to look for the kingdom of God, Jesus said the kingdom of God is in you, the ruling of Jesus in your life, as you and I are citizens of the kingdom. But one day the Bible says that Jesus is going to rule and reign over the earth. But in the meantime, as with King Saul, the devil is doing his best by force to keep the rightful king from sitting upon the throne and maybe even in a smaller way from dislodging your loyalty and commitment to the Lord in your own life, trying to remove the headship of Jesus Christ in your life in a variety of different ways. But even as Saul was destroyed and David ultimately sits upon the throne, so is the throne of David to be filled by that descendant of David, Jesus Christ, whom God has appointed the rightful king over the earth. So with that in mind, chapter 19 is a section where David, well, he's, he's now going to be chased by King Saul. King Saul has vowed to kill him. And we will watch David in this time of great stress as we see him under tremendous pressure, the sentence of death hanging over him, being pursued, and even according to David's own words, like a wild partridge over the mountains by Saul. We see David with lapses of faith. Have you had lapses of faith because of great stress and pressure? I'm sure you have. Stress and pressure will do weird things to you. Not only, you know, those those doctors and such will study those things, talk about the damaging effect that stress has on the body, but the Bible says that stress and pressure has a damaging effect upon your spiritual life as well. How careful we need to be. We're going to watch David be a real man here. You always have to keep in mind that David is still a man after God's own heart and yet with failure. You'll see a lot of yourself, I'm sure, in David's life. We don't see David as a picture of constant faith and trust in God. We see him rather vacillating up and down, back and forth. Sometimes speaking of, sometimes the Bible's going to speak of his great trust in the Lord and other times the Bible's going to speak of his great distrust, making really bad decisions. And as we read of David, the condition of his heart, his deceptions, his lies in order to escape the hand of Saul, it's easy to throw our spears at David, isn't it? We're we're looking at King David picking up the spear and throwing it, but it would be easy for us to sit, well, to sit in some kind of self-righteous judgment upon him. I mean, David, how could you do this? 
David, what are you doing? No, you want to be careful there. Because the Bible is like a mirror to us. The Bible itself speaks of being a mirror. And as we see the lapses of faith, as I have been studying these sections, I pray for my own lapses of faith. I pray for the, old, the, the, the presence of stress and pressure in my life. Both the stress and pressure I know about <laughs> and the, some that I have no idea when it's coming, where it's coming, or how it's coming. But I know it's coming. I know that that weird email is going to come. I know that phone call is going to come. I know it. I know it. Why do I know it? Because I know that any time that I press in, the Bible says this. And I don't just speak of Ed. When I say I, I should say we. How about that? How about you join me on my little journey here of the stress and pressures of life? We know that the email's coming. We know the phone. We know the situation's happening. We know it's coming because the Bible says that even for those that desire to live godly, will suffer. Just the desire, let alone those of you that have said, no, it's not just a desire, pastor. It's a life. This is my life. I have set my life on the course to please God. I am making my decisions now that which please God and not my emotion, those that please God and not my pocketbook, those that please God and not my family, whatever it might be, how careful we need to be not to pick up spears ourselves at the text and say, David, how could you? Why would you? You're supposed to be this great king. You're supposed to be a man after God's own heart, and indeed he is. It's mindful, are we not? It reminds us of Jesus in John chapter 8 facing that woman that was caught in the very act. And what were his words to her? To, what was his words to her? Hey, whoever, to, the, to those that came like, accusing her, actually, he says, whoever it was without sin, you throw the first stone. So keep in mind, the section of Samuel that we're going to be in moving forward will be quite discouraging. And yet, in, dis, in spite of David's failures, and in spite of his lapses of faith, it's comforting to know that God's testimony of him is that he is a man after God's own heart, and that encourages me. I'm glad the Bible is honest enough to tell us the whole story about its heroes. They're not without flaw. They're not without stumbles. They're, well, the heroes of God are very much like you and I, normal human beings dealing with the issues of life. It doesn't seek to paint the heroes of God as perfect men or women, not so. It shows that they're human. And so now, pick up in verse 1 with me in chapter 19. It says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, son, Saul's son, delighted much in David. Why? Because they had one of those serious, wonderful friendships. And as we learned in previous studies, it was a, a good friendship. It was a friendship of fidelity and loyalty. It wasn't anything weird about it. And so, verse 2, Jonathan told David, saying, My father seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning and stay in a secret place and hide. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will speak with my father about you. Then what I observe, I will tell you. Now Jonathan, verse 4, spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he's not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he took his life in his hands and killed the Philistine, and the Lord brought about a great salvation for all of Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? So Saul heeded the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be killed. <laughs> then Jonathan called David, and Jonathan told him all these things. And so Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as in times past. King Saul is jealous and threatened by David, so he's determined to kill him. This isn't a fleeting statement. This is from his heart, as Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It wasn't an accident. It wasn't just something, oops, I said something wrong. We have an indication of the heart of King Saul here. We have an indication of really what his motives are, what he's thinking, what he's desiring. He's gone over the edge now in envy and rage. Saul's previous attempts to get rid of David have either been private, as we saw in the previous chapter, or under the radar, not so open. 
Now he's gone a little out of his mind, ordering to kill David and then backing down at the words of his son. He's up, you know, talk about David going up and down. Saul has got these weird, these really huge mood swings in his life. Some today might even look at him as not being in his right mind, perhaps. But it's interesting in verse 1, he says that Saul speaks to his son. He tells Jonathan, knowing full well the kind of friendship that Jonathan has with David, and tells him anyway. He's not even caring about his close, those that are close in family. And he speaks of the friendship now that Jonathan has, because in verse 2, he goes and tells David right away. Now, remember back a, a few chapters ago, we, we saw the relationship between Jonathan and his armor bearer. And remember how they went together and they had great exploits and great victory, tremendous step of faith. Now, during our time in that Bible study, most of the emphasis was upon the armor bearer. We don't know him. We don't know his name. But we, man, we're like, we, we were emphasizing, weren't we? That's the kind of support we need to be and to the leaders in our church, to the pastors in our church, to have that armor bearer like-mindedness. We emphasize that to its highest degree, I believe. However, in order for the armor bearer to have such great trust in Jonathan, Jonathan had to be an incredible man. A man of fidelity, a man of truth, a man of loyalty to God. There were characteristics in him that inspired others to follow him. And oh, that we would have people like armor bearers in our lives, but also that we would have people like Jonathan in our lives, and of course that we would be those. You take into account that this conversation must have been a hard one. One of those that if you could, you would want to avoid it. The one that, that you get the phone call and says, you know, we need to talk, and you kind of know what it's going to be about, and you're like, well, what time? Four o'clock. Oh, I can't be there at four o'clock. How about five? Nope, can't be there at five. What about six? Can't make it at six. How about seven? Never at seven. You know, and you're just going on. I, and, and really what you should say is, I really don't want to have this conversation. But you have to. And Jonathan, again, he could have avoided this. He could have just, you know, Dad, I'm not going to get involved in it. I don't want anything to do with it. But, but he, he didn't. He didn't avoid it. Even as painful and as hurtful as it must have been, he comes to his father in humility and yet in boldness. He called his dad. He said what his dad was doing. Notice verse 4. He said his, he called, in a loving way, but he looks his dad in the eye and goes, you're, you're sinning. You think about one of those hard decisions. But you know, God has put believers on the earth today to say the hard things, not to back down, not to shy away, but to say the hard things. Of course, saying those things in love, as Paul would say, saying those things in humility, saying those things that need to be said. Because I ask you, if we as believers in tune with the Holy Spirit aren't willing to say the hard things, then who's left on the earth to say hard things with any type of spiritual, godly, biblical authority? I suggest to you, no one. We shouldn't have to hear the hard things on the newscast from unbelievers. We shouldn't have to hear the hard things in someone writing a lay. The believers of Jesus Christ are here to declare the good news. And sometimes in declaring good news, well, it's going to require us to, to say hard things to people that we love. To tell your own dad that he's in sin must have been very hard for Jonathan, but he's not thinking in terms of fearing man. He's thinking in terms of fearing God. Not only that, in verse 4, he, in the beginning, he's speaking well of David. Why? Because David had a life to speak well of. How do you speak well of people? Because you have a life that speaks well. How can people speak well of you? Because your life reflects the goodness of God. David is described as the one that hasn't sinned. And Saul is the one that sinned. He reminds him in verse 5 how he took his own life in his hands and by great faith inspired of God took on the giant Goliath. And why are you going again sinning against innocent blood in verse 5? And so Saul heeded the voice, but not for long. Verse 8, and there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a mighty blow and they fled from him. Now the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pen David to the wall with the spear, 
But he slipped away from Saul's presence and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. David being used greatly and mightily of God, keeping his eyes focused no matter all the weirdness that's happening around him. He is a single-minded man at this point, faithfully doing what God has called him to do, and Saul again is upset. And we've learned in previous studies that this distressing spirit, the demonic realm under the authority of God, you know, when, when King Saul turns his back, when he turns his back from God, turns his back upon God, and he starts to go in the opposite direction. He's going into the realm of the devil. And so he's distressed. He is under attack. And that's when he picks up the spear once again. And David once again flees and escapes. This time he gets far away. Now Saul, verse 11, sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. Didn't he just say he wasn't going to kill him? Yes. And now he's ready to do it again. Why? Because that was the depth of his heart. I'm sure you've heard the phrase before, but words are cheap. Words are cheap. Actions speak louder than words. And we can see that, Dave, that King Saul, to his son, to appease him, oh, everything's fine. But truly his heart is unchanged, unfortunately. And here he sends messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him. And Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michal took an image and laid it in the bed, put a cover of goat's hair for his head, and covered it with clothes. So when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers back to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed that I may kill him. <laughs> and when the messengers had come in, there was the image in the bed with a cover of goat's hair for his head. Then Saul said to Mishal, Why have you deceived me like this and sent my enemy away so that, is he es that, so that he has escaped? And Mishal answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? David's getting more and more attention. Remember back in chapter, seven, or in chapter 18, verse 7, the ladies were already singing about him with his great exploits at war, comparing him to King Saul. And King Saul so far from God that he was open to the work and the influence of the demonic realm. They were at home in his life. And then he picks up the spear again. And then he goes after at his house where his daughter is, wanting to take David out. Hold your places here. Would you turn over to Psalm 59 with me? Psalm 59 is a great place to turn as we get a little bit of background on what's going on in this time in David's life. Psalm 59. You'll notice in the title it says, To the chief musician set to do not destroy a Mitchum of David when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. Where is that? First Samuel chapter 19. So this psalm is on his heart during this time. This is what was going on in David's heart. Verse 1. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity and save me from bloodthirsty men. For look, they w lie in wait for my life. The mighty gather against me. Not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Lord. They run and prepare themselves, though no fault of mine. Awake to help me, and behold, you therefore, O God, Lord, of, Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations, to not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. And then that word selah, remember, in a psalm is a pause. It's a musical instruction. It also can be interpreted as a pause where, where you, you know how you take just a deep breath to think about something. This is a heavy psalm to write. As David is, again, not taking things into his own hands, but fleeing for his life, he goes home to a place that should be safe. In verse 6, at the evening they return, they growl like a dog. Go all around the city. Indeed, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are on, in their lips, for they say, who hears? They think they're getting away with it. But you, O Lord, shall laugh at them. You shall have all the nations in derision. Verse 9, O you, his strength, I will wait for you. What a great place to be. For God is my defense. 
My merciful God shall come to meet me. God shall let me see my desire on my enemies. Do not slay them, verse 11, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride for their cursing and lying which they speak. Consume them in wrath, consume them, that they may not be, and let them know that God rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. (sighs) Another deep breath. At evening they return, they growl like a dog, they go all around the city, they wander up and down for food, and how if they are not satisfied? Verse 16, but I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. You have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O my strength, I sing praises, for God is my defense, the God of my mercy. There's a little insight of what's going on in David's heart. And you can see he's crying out for, he's crying out for God's righteous judgment. He's back and forth. He goes, take him away. No, don't take him away. God, you're my defense. Defend me. No, you are my defense. It's beautiful. Verse 18 now. So David again fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed at Naoth. I wonder how that conversation went. He went and told Samuel everything that Samuel warned the nation about when they chose the king the first time. How hard that must have been for Samuel to hear. Why? Because because of the people's choices, the people are suffering. They wanted a king, they got their king. And their king is corrupt. Their king so quickly turned his back upon the Lord. And not only is David paying the price, but so are others. This is how Saul ran his kingdom. Now it was told, verse 19, Saul saying, Take note, David is at Naoth and Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the group of prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing leader over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when Saul was told, he sent other messengers And they prophesied likewise. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. This is pretty funny. This is a funny thing that's being described in the scriptures. As Saul is sending people to go take uh, David, when they come upon the prophesying, they get caught up in the prophesying. And don't see this as they become spiritual men all of a sudden. They just get caught up in the action, and they couldn't follow through. So word gets back to Saul. He sends another group. Samuel's there in the spirit. There's really a great picture here, and that's simply this. You are untouchable in the Lord. You are untouchable. How many times are you going to send people after you, send people after you, send people after you? In the spirit, you're untouchable. In the flesh, you're on your own. (laughs) And you have less than a 50-50 chance of surviving anything that gets thrown your way. Most likely in the flesh, you're going to respond in the flesh, and it's going to make things worse, and the devil's going to win. But here they are. They get caught up in, well, David runs to Samuel, a picture, Samuel, this prophet of God. He's in that protective place, running to the right place at the right time. He's not running back into the world, although we will see that. Well, we'll see some some really sad things in David's life. But at least now, he runs to Samuel, that representative of God. He runs to the right place. He's in the right place. And that puts a place of protection of God upon him. God is protecting him. It's not his decisions. His decisions are putting him in the right place. The protection comes from God. God has his hand upon him. And so, it says in verse 22, he also went to Ramah, came to the great well that's at Sekiu. So he asked and said, where are Samuel and David? And someone said, indeed, they're at Naoth and Ramah. And so he went there to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him. And also he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Very interesting. A very interesting situation as Saul at this season of his life is humiliated by the protection of God. Not only were they able to talk, but they went together, you know, Saul and Samuel and David, not only were they able to be encouraged and uplifted, but they were able to go to the next town. 
And what a time of encouragement. David needed this as we saw in Psalm 59. It reminds me of the beautiful comfort that comes to God's people by friends, God's spokesmen. Uh, Turn over to Proverbs chapter 25. Let's look at a few Proverbs together. How important your words are, church. How important your voice is in the plan and the direction of God. I mean, of course, with your mouth, you can make big mistakes, but man, with your mouth, you can really encourage someone. You can really speak a word in due season. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11. And how I pray that you and I would use our mouths in a way that would build up and not tear down. That we would edify. In Proverbs chapter 25, verse 11, it says, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. A word fitly spoken. Look at chapter 15 now, verse 23. A word fitly spoken. Chapter 15, Proverbs 15, verse 23. It says, Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors... I'm I'm reading verse 22 because I just want to throw that one in. It wasn't a mistake. It was just throwing it in. (laughs) Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors that are established, verse 23, a man has joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good it is. Have you ever had a word spoken to you in due season? You know, there's so much technology now that words can be spoken in due season all over the place. You, if you got a smartphone, you could set up your smartphone just to remind you with a good word in the morning. You're going to say, Siri, wake me up with a good word. Doot, No. You know, whatever she wants to say. That. It's like, man. You could set up reminders. You can send texts now. You can, I mean, there's so many things that even if God hasn't sent somebody into your life, you could speak a good word to yourself. You can encourage yourself in the Lord. How important it is. But how great it is when God sends a friend your way. Sends a note in the mail. Sends an email, perhaps, or a knock on the door, or a phone call. Somebody walks over to your cubicle from the other side of the building. Just God moving upon their hearts, moving upon your heart to speak a word in due season. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 24, verse 26. Proverbs 24, verse 26. Within our fellowship family, it's so vital to speak a word in due season. I mean, you can, be, you can bring so much joy and happiness to someone by simply giving them what God has given you. Look at verse 20, 26, verse, chapter 24, verse 26. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. Now, you know, a kiss is an intimate thing. It, it is something of intimacy and closeness. This isn't speaking of a romantic kiss, but rather the kind of kiss of fellowship, the sweetness of intimacy by your words. It's not literally having you go up and, hey, I've got a good word for you. God, you know, you're just known as the, the weird person that kisses all the time. Not, not, not like that at all. It's not even culturally acceptable in, in our culture right now. You know, we do the handshake and the hugs and those types of things. But this, you got to remember the culture, even in the Middle Eastern culture, uh, that still to this very day, a kiss on the cheek is very, very close and intimate. But have you ever thought of your words? Have you ever thought of your words being that close and intimate to bless someone else? It's just beautiful. It's so much better than, you know, talking smack. And it's so much better than sarcasm. And it's so much better than talking about things that have no eternal value. It's so much better than just kind of, you know, talking about things where, while they may not be sinful and no no big deal, I'm asking you, I'm asking you to come back to a sensitivity to use your mouth in a way that when you answer, you have the right answer. It's that reminder of the intimacy that we have in the body of Christ. Now, back in 1 Samuel, we can't move on from this section without talking just a little bit about this gift of prophecy that the Bible teaches is within the body of Christ today. Remember Romans chapter 12? In Romans chapter 12, verse 6, it says, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that's given to us, let's use them. If prophecy, then let's prophesy in proportion to our faith. There are some among us today, you have your primary gifting. The the thing that moves you is that prophetic gifting. 
And what I mean by the prophetic gifting is not what some would say today, where you're always thus saying the Lord, thus saying the Lord, thus saying the Lord, and you're trying to prophesy or predict the future. That that is not the New Testament gifting of prophecy. Many people, you'll think of prophecy, you think, well, it must be thus saith the Lord. And it always has to be thus, old King James language, thus saith the Lord. It could be, you know, it could be anything, but that, that's how the folks have been taught and discipled. Thus saith the Lord. And indeed, God has said much. In the Old Testament, the gift of prophecy was often in the realm of foretelling, for sure. Telling the future. God had a purpose in giving forth the future through a man's voice. The scripture is yet to be written. But the Bible says that we have been given the faith. We, we've been given the faith. It's once for all delivered. The, the Bible, as its revelation of God, is closed. God is not giving new revelation. He's not adding pages to the scripture. We have the word of God handed to us and delivered to us over the century. So then what is this prophetic gift? Well, first of all, we don't have time to get into the depth of this, so I would encourage you to go. You can use the app or go to the website, calvaryaurora.org, and I taught through those primary giftings in Romans chapter 12. We spent one week per gift, and then a few weeks before that to explain spiritual gifts and the spiritual realm so you know you don't serve in the church like you serve in the world. You don't serve just with good training or going to class. Like God has dumped a spiritual gift or two or three into you. And if the prophetic gifting is yours, we need you because it uses your mouth. We need you to speak forth the words that God has given you from his word. So it's not just foretelling. The New Testament use of this gift is more forthtelling, speaking forth the word of God. And the definition of what true, the true prophetic gift is, you know, and it's, it's not just when we gather for afterglows, although when we do gather together for believers meeting and afterglows, we're always desperately praying for those that have the gift of prophecy to speak forth the word. Of course, we want to know. We want to receive. We, we want to understand. And not only that, this is what happens when you prophesy. Jot it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 Verse 2 says, He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. You get three things from that gift, or one of three things, or two of three things, or all three of three things. You get number one, you have edification. That's what? To build one another up. We've already looked at that part of prophecy, speaking forth God's word. Or exhortation. Exhortation is, is movement is movement. You, you can compare exhortation, or you could contrast, I should say, exhortation with encouragement, those two things. Somebody with the gift of encouragement, which we all want people around us to have the gift of encouragement, don't you? I mean, how, who, how would you not want to hear just somebody coming along and building you up, and yes, that's awesome, and yes, let's go do the encouragement. Encouragement takes a person and lifts them up. And who doesn't want to be lifted up? I mean, I know you might have times, I totally understand and completely relate with those dark and dreary days where you just don't want to answer the phone and you don't want to talk to anybody. Uh, you got to be careful in those. You could be very self-absorbed and you, you, you want, you know, even if you're not praying, somebody's praying that an encourager will come your way just to lift you up because you don't want to stay there. It's a very difficult place, very dark times. Uh, I do know it happens and I do know that even David went through this as we'll see. But you want an encourager. You want somebody to lift you up. Who doesn't want somebody to lift you up? Of course. Now, an exhorter, not everybody likes exhorters. <laughs> because exhorters don't lift you up. They push you on. You know, they, they move you forward. And when you get pushed around, let me tell you something. I don't know you all that well, but I could tell you this. You don't like it. You don't like to be pushed. You don't like to be pushed physically. I mean, think about it. You're there. You're in line at Safeway. There's only two people in line, but the person behind you, they're pushing their cart so close to you, they get the back of your ankles. Do you like that? Just think of exhortation. It's like, what are you doing? I'm just like, hold on, there's only two of us. There's nobody here. Relax. No, no, we gotta get going, gotta get going, gotta get going. Or, or, or somebody that gets, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll be speaking to people and, and they'll get in your space. I don't know what your space is, but I meet a lot of people, I talk to a lot of people, and some people are like, like this. And, and you kind of, you know, you're being very gentle and very kind, you kind of turn over, and then they're like, think exhortation next time that happens to you, because they're getting a little too close for you. 
You've got that little artificial place that this is my space and this is, yeah, yeah. And you have the same thing in, in your life spiritually. You like to stand in line at your own pace. You know, I, I was not too long ago, I was, I don't know what day it was, it was sometime this week, but I was in my lane at the red light and then right there at Smoky Hill and Reservoir, right there by the church. And, um, and then there was the turn lane and I saw the light turn green and I wanted to tell that person to take off, but I didn't. Uh, the guy next to me, uh, 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 and I don't know what was going on in that gal, but she missed the light. And, and I was curious, because I thought, she's texting. No doubt about it, she's texting Mr. Uh, non-judgmental pastor guy that I am. <laughs> And so I peek I, as, you know, that person, she didn't make the light. The guy behind her didn't make the light. And, and as I'm driving by, I'm peeking through the window. What was she doing? Texting. <laughs> and the Lord is saying, it's okay, Ed. I got you covered, man. So you think, you know, maybe you miss a light sometimes. Maybe it's not texting. Maybe you're just so caught up with the kids or you just miss it. You're kind of daydreaming. It happens to us all. And somebody's behind you. Uh, uh, uh. You know what you should think? Exhortation. They're not rolling down their window saying, can you please move forward with a green light? We all have somewhere to go. You'll be happy. I'll be happy. That's encouragement. You never see it like that. It doesn't happen like that. But exhortation, it's moving, 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 moving. And in, in our spiritual lives, we stand in line at a casual pace, and we need to be moved on sometimes. In our spiritual lives, we daydream, or we're caught off guard texting. We're, we're doing something we really shouldn't be doing at all. And God will send what? Someone with the gift of exhortation moving us on. How is that? Well, it's the gift of prophecy often. The person that's given the gift, the person with the gift of prophecy is going to move you on. And God will send that person. Thirdly, pro, pro, those with the gift of prophecy can also bring comfort. It comes different ways. It, it's speaking forth. God has given some men and women in the church the supernatural ability to take God's word and use it appropriately in our lives. Just at the right time. Instantly. The gift of prophecy as it moves among the church today, is giving forth the word of God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's not just taking it, you know, it's not like... Boom. Therefore, the princes were angry with Jeremiah, and they struck him and put him in prison in the house of Jonathan the scribe, for they, made the, for they had made that the prison. That's the word of the Lord. To you. Not like, like that. It's not just like flipping through and letting the fan catch a word. It's like, no, you are so in turn with the, tune with the Holy Spirit that, that, and you are gifted, you, you, and you see the characteristics. You're, you're, you're a person that, that seems to see things in black and white. And when you see a situation, the Lord just gives you a word. And, and you know, you should listen to that study. I think many of you have the gift of prophecy and, and you're like, I, I don't even know what gift I have. You've got to know your spiritual gifts. We spent week after week after week, not only in Romans, but also in 1 Corinthians, saying this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like in your life. Exercise it. I believe one of the accountability we're going to have at the Great White, or not at the Great White Throne, only unbelievers will be there, but at the Bema Seat of Christ will be why and when we didn't use our giftings, while we sat on them. And then God's going to say, well, you know, didn't you go to Calvary Chapel or Roar? Yes. <laughs> well, weren't you? Yes. Well, give me two crowns for that, you know, or whatever, whatever that is. I don't know how it's all going to go down, but we're responsible to use our giftings for the kingdom of God. We're not just church attenders. This world needs a tangible touch of God, and the way that he touches people is through the Spirit of God in believers of God with the Word of God. That's how he does it. Amazing things take place when you yield yourself to the things of God. Amazing things take place. When you obey God, amazing things take place when you move in the gifting that God has for you. And some of you have the prophetic gifting and you're not using it. Or maybe you were even taught wrong in another church that the prophetic gifting is some weird thing where you just have to stand up and thus saith the Lord and boss people around. Not so. When you have the prophetic gifting, you're going to what? Exhort people? Possibly. Comfort people? And what was the other one? Edify people. Or all three or two, or just one. We all, the Bible says, desire the spiritual gifts, but especially the gift of prophecy. Especially. Why? Because he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. 
And you want that in your life. Now, what we're seeing in chapter 19 is not true, the true prophetic utterance of the Spirit. It is getting caught up in the emotion of it. And God is using the faithfulness of Samuel to not only thwart a plan, a, a murderous plan, but to humiliate and bring humiliation and humility into King Saul once more, which you see in verse 24, the nakedness, the exposure of the folly of his life. We see the power of God protecting David. Saul wanted to kill him. He sent messengers to take David, but each time he'd send the messengers, the Spirit of God would come upon them and they would prophesy. They'd be helpless to do anything else against David. Finally, Saul comes himself, and the Spirit of God also intervenes, and he's helpless to touch David. And thus, David becomes divinely protected from Saul. And because we find that God, through God, he divinely intervened, David, in his lapse of faith and trust in God, we're going to see he's going to resort to, David's going to resort to his own devices to escape from Saul. It's, it's amazing how often we see the faithfulness of God and still take things in our own hands. Well, so did David. We'll see that in further studies. It was the word of the Lord, specifically, that David should be king, and that David, well, we find him not, not willing to rest while God will bring it to pass. Though he saw the hand of God delivering him, he lapsed to his own devices, so much like us. Even though we see the power of God in our lives, we've seen God provide, we've seen God's faithfulness, we've seen time and time again God's blessings in our life, we begin to panic when troublesome situations arise. Panic and pressure. Never, never really things that God uses to move us. Panic. You know, we can forget so quickly what God has already done. And we can forget so quickly the promises of God and the deliverance of God in the past that we often will turn to our flesh in the hour of trouble and despair. So David, he fled from Naoth in Ramah. Saul came, David got out, and even though Saul's under the power of the Spirit, he couldn't do anything. And then verse 1 of chapter 20, David fled from Naoth in Ramah and went and said to Jonathan, what have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? We'll carry on in our study next time, the life of David on the run. And maybe even like your life, not always happy. It's not always a good thing to panic. I mean, really, it's not always. It's never a good thing to panic and to get into modes where I'll take care of this and I'll take the pressure off and I'll take the stress. It's much better what? To trust and obey. There is no other way. It's just much better to wait on the Lord. Let him renew your strength, trusting him. And, and if today, right now, listening in, you need to recall a time in the past, maybe in the near past, of God's faithfulness, I would encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you tonight, before you go to bed, just to ask God and, and at, thank God. Thank God for his faithfulness in the past and just meditate on it. You know, Lord, you really, you were there before and this is the way it was and God starts to remind you of how bad it was and all the pressure and all the difficulty, how there was no way out. You know, you think of Moses, how many times Moses, as he was dealing with the people and, and because of our daily reading, you know, we're all back in that section of scripture. We all have just finished it. I'm going chronologically, so just reading through again uh, a few weeks ago about all that uh, Moses had to go through and the complaining people and the, man, the, oh, it was, what a, what a difficult ministry that brother was called to. What a difficult ministry he was called to wander in the wilderness. And he let his flesh get the best of him. And he lost out. He never did get to see. I taught there from Mount Nebo uh, when we took a trip to Petra and I went over to Mount Nebo. You can, it was kind of hazy that day, but I can imagine in my, in my own mind what that must have looked like to be able to see from that vantage point, because it was very high, that vantage point from the area of Jordan all the way into the promised land, from all the way from the north to the south and thinking, I'm never getting in. I'm never getting in. Why? Because it got the best of him in this flesh. When's it going to stop? When will it end? Not, not our study in 1 Samuel, of course, but that little sinful compromise. When's it going to end? Well, the Bible says it ends in death. Well, Ed, I have a handle on it. You, you don't have a handle on sin. Sin has, well, maybe you have a little, it has a little toehold in you. And of course, with toehold, you just shake them off, huh? Just toehold. It's like nothing. 
But over time, toe holds, well, they grab your ankle and then you can't move so fast. It's not, it's so easy to shake a while. Got to grab on my ankle. What's, what is this? It was that little decision. You know, the one that you nurtured, the one you let go, the one that it's a lot bigger than you thought it was, huh? You can't, it's not so easy to shake off. And now, wait a minute, I got to feel some tightness on my waist. I know, now they're grabbing your waist. It's not as easy to, to shake off like it was when you could get out of the toe hold, like it was where you could get rid of the ankle hold, but now the waist, I mean, that's a tough one. You got to do a lot of effort and energy, and, and before you know it, your toe, your ankle, your waist, and now, wait a minute, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Yeah, I know, now you, it's a strangling the very spiritual life out of you. When's it going to end? Oh, Ed, I would never pick up a spear. Really? Oh, Ed, I would never. It'll never happen to me. Be very careful when you use the word never in your vocabulary. That that is a broad word, isn't it? And be very careful when you find yourself using the word never in your vocabulary as it relates to sin. Somebody falls very hard in your family and and you're like, you're kind of on that path, but you're not there. Oh, that'll never happen. You, know, you watch out. You're deceived. You see something happen on the news. Oh, that'll never. Yeah, that's what they thought too. With the little, every time they were shaking it off. Yeah, that's what they thought. Just a little toehold. But now they're facing 30 years to life. It's not so much a toehold anymore, is it? Or some crazy thing, some crazy thought, some backslidden, like you're, you, you, you know you're sitting next to an empty chair. Those chairs used to be filled with people that were following the Lord, man. Those chairs used to be filled with people on fire for the things of God. Those chairs used to be filled with, well, pews all around, they used to be filled with people that when they heard the word of God, they hungered and thirst for righteousness. But now, I mean, come on got this going on over here and this going on over here and I don't have time for that and the Bible study and 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 I don't you know please don't misunderstand me I don't think sitting in a chair qualifies us as disciples of Jesus but I can tell you it's one of the things you can look for your desire to be with other believers because generally believers like to hang out with believers and edify and build one another up and exhort one another and comfort one another generally Generally, we have that desire to grow in God's knowledge. Generally, we have that desire that when a man falls, though a man falls seven times, he'll rise again. We generally want to get up, say, no, Lord, I know I'm not perfect. I know there's weaknesses in my life, but I'm desperate for you. But over time, the little toe hold, the little ankle hold, the strangle hold, it relates to a person that is backslidden. As we'll see this weekend, guys, when we're back in John's gospel and we're going to look at how, how do we minister to those that have strayed away. I'm so looking forward to that. I want to train and equip us and remind us how do we minister to them. I'm going to give you a sneak peek for you guys that are here because you're here on Wednesday. So turn over to James. Let me give you the verses you can start meditating on this week. James chapter 5. I'm going to tie James chapter 5 in with John chapter 8 at the end. Where Jesus says, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. It's almost like Jesus saying, welcome to the family of God. You're free. You don't have to commit adultery anymore. You don't have to live in sexual sin. You are free. Don't sin anymore. Walk in freedom. Well, check this out. In verse 19 of James, this is where we'll be. We'll tie them together. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone, who does that someone? That's us. Someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So each time you're in a congregation, whether it's here or in your church, you have pews in your church, uh, you have chairs, you're meeting in a school perhaps, or a recreational center, whenever you're in church and you see an empty chair, pray for the soul that used to sit in it pray they may have strayed away and and if you're a newer church you're just planning you see an empty chair pray for the soul that belongs there and you start praying people into the kingdom of god because when you're praying for the strays and you're praying for the new believers you know people that need to know jesus you know who god's going to lead you to the strays and the people that need jesus
It's right there in front of you. So, Lord, we thank you for the warning, exhortation. We, we don't like it. We admit to you, Lord, we're not so happy with exhortation. Uh, we don't like to be pushed. We, we don't like to be honked at. Uh, we, we don't like to be up in our grill, in our space, Lord. We, but, but we need it. We need you to spiritually be up in our face. We need you spiritually to push us on. We need you spiritually to honk at us when we're distracted. Uh, so that we might be about our Father's business. And we don't want to use the word never in our vocabulary. Of course we will, but we don't want to. And when we see some desperate, horrible, stupid thing uh, being done, Lord, by someone, Lord, I pray that it would drive us to prayer, drive us to our knees. And, And even for those listening in, like, I'll never be like King Saul. Be careful. Be careful with the word never. And Lord, I thank you for recording Psalm 59 <clears throat> during the time of David, uh, during this section of scripture here in chapter 19, so we could get a little sense. We, we, we know it's in Saul's heart, and now we know it's also in David's heart. And ultimately, Saul's judge for his sin, and great was his fall. And so, Lord, we pray even now that you would guard and protect us, lead us and guide us, and let us be men and women following after you, Lord. And if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, I, I know that today is the day of salvation. You have a church praying for you. We pray for salvation in New Zealand. We pray for salvation in Mexico. We pray for the leaders. I mean, we pray for people to come and know Jesus Christ through the ministry, and we've prayed for you. Maybe you're out on television right now and uh, you're on the radio listening in in your car and you're just not walking with the Lord. You just, your relationship with God is strained or you've never given your life to Jesus for the very first time. Today, I'm going to ask you to respond to the invitation to come and know Jesus personally, that today would be the day of your salvation. And so if that's you and you'd say, Ed, I do need to follow God with my life. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you that today would be the day. God bless you in the back. Who else would say, that's me, and and we would just be happy with you. We're so grateful that you would have the courage and the boldness to take a stand for Jesus Christ today. And I realize you might be downstairs and I don't see you and, uh, you know, on the radio or anything, I don't see you, but God does. That's all that matters. Because you're not, salvation doesn't come from this church and salvation doesn't come from pastor or the music team. God saves you. And I just really believe there's more. So if that's you, today's the day. Respond to the gospel. No more. Put it off. No more. You're not promised tomorrow. If that's you, just stand to your feet. Let us pray with you. Let me lead you in a prayer today that God would change your life forever. You would leave here different. God bless you. You leave here different than when you came in. Supernaturally. I know you come in with the same clothes and they're walking out with the same shoes and probably feeling the same feelings, but God has moved upon your heart. You're a different person. The Bible says that if you will conf- believe in your heart the Lord Jesus, confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so I encourage you. I encourage you to follow Jesus with all of your life. Ask God to save you right now. Uh, you could pray this prayer right after me. You could say, Dear God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe you sent Jesus Christ to live for me, to die for me, and I believe he rose again and is alive today. I follow him with all my life. Help me, God, to turn away from my sinful past and to turn my life towards you. And God, I know that truly something spiritual happens for those that are genuine and real. And and we don't know. We don't know what's going on in their life or their heart right now. It could be an emotional turn. It could be just what's going on in their life right now. But hey, if this is it, then I pray right now that you would apprehend their hearts, Lord, and you would hear their prayer and that a supernatural work of your spirit would take place and we would see lives transformed right before our eyes. And I just pray, God, that you would guard and protect us from ourselves and the weakness of our flesh, that you might get all the glory, all the strength, 
all the attention in our lives in these last days. I know times are tough. I know there's chaos in the world and, and uh, crazy persecution against believers around the world, just torturous murders and, and insanity. But Jesus, you hung on a cross. What's more insane than that? And you overcame sin and death. And by faith, we follow you, God. And I pray that we would have the strength and tenacity not to give up and not play games, but to be seriously about the Father's business. In Jesus' name, amen.